in our program. <laughs> Over the past week, all of us in our community have keenly felt the loss of Rav Lutzenstein, Zeyfer Tzadik Lebracha, a Gadol Hador whose thought and whose character shaped so much of our religious community. Today we'll have the opportunity to hear perspectives on three different aspects of Rav Lutzenstein's legacy. My own interactions with Rav Lutzenstein were in the context of my anot. He was the posik of our school, and I had occasion to call him a number of times for guidance on questions that came up. Sometimes these were questions of a religious, of an overtly religious nature about halachic practices or the religious direction of the school. But just as often, or even maybe more often, they were ethical questions about questions like hiring practices and other ethical issues that come, come up in running an institution. And these were issues with, to which Rav Lutzenstein um, related with, with enormous integrity and care. There were two aspects of speaking with Rav Lichtenstein on the occasions that I did which were particularly striking to me. One was his accessibility. He, it was a function of his humility that he answered his own phone and that in various ways he consciously made it easy for people to reach him. And the other was that whenever I sought his counsel, no matter what the issue was, um, he took great care to understand all of the nuances of the issue at hand and his conclusion was reached always through a process of conversation, of considering different perspectives on the issue, such that his conclusion emerged gradually and naturally over the course of that discussion. And having the benefit of his wisdom and moral guidance was a tremendous good for our school and an experience from which I learned a great deal. I'm pleased to present our first speaker, Mrs. Esther Krauss, who will share thoughts on Rebel Finstein's involvement in my note from the school's inception. Mrs. Krauss is a distinguished educator who has been involved in Jewish education for women throughout her career. She taught Judaic and general studies at a number of high schools before serving as the founding principal of Maya Note. Her vision and leadership shaped Maya Note and, and set the framework for, for everything that our school has become. We're honored to have us with her with us today. Thank you very much, Mrs. Khan and for Maya Note for asking me to come here. It's really a pleasure to be here, although not under these circumstances, obviously. And um, I feel kind of at home in this room. We learn in Perkei Avot, Kne lecha rab, vase lecha chaver. Acquire for yourself a Rebbe, and make, make or find for yourself a friend. I, we, the Jewish community, lost a Rebbe and a friend last week. With the, with the passing of Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein, Zichron Tzadik, Zichron Bracha. I never learned with him in his Beit Midrash, at Yeshivat Haaretzion. I didn't schmooze with him on the phone very often. I didn't even text him. We didn't get together with him and his wife very often, but he was my Rebbe and my friend nevertheless. It's very difficult to describe to you who Rav Lichtenstein was and what he stood for in a way that would help to make him more real and more relevant to you. But the more you hear and the more you read about him, and there's loads on the internet, the better you will come to understand who he was and what we've lost. It's an important part of your education because of his great importance to Klal Yisrael, of course, and specifically to us, the modern Orthodox community, because he was and is our Rebbe. So let me try. Rav Aaron, as everyone affectionately called him, was a real, a genuine person, an ish, a mensch, with no artificial trappings. He was totally unassuming, with no airs about him, in spite of his great stature. He seemed totally unaware of his own greatness. Someone approached me the other day, shocked to hear to see that he didn't have a beard. The Shorish Ish, inclusive of Visha and Ashim, is an ordinary word that appears many times in Tanakh and fills many pages in the concordance. It designates a person, any person, an ordinary person, if you will, but in Parshat Shlach, in the story of the Miraglim, Rashi points out that anashim means anashim chashuvim. They were important people and leaders of the tribe. So what does Ish mean? Is it an ordinary person? 
or an important person. Well, if we look at where the word Ish first appears in Breshit, Adam is given the job of naming all the creatures. He names himself only after he encounters another human being like himself with the names Ish and Isha. Now, Adam wasn't asked to name the creatures as a technical job, I don't believe. I think it was Hashem's way of directing Adam to learn all about the world in which he was placed and of which he was given responsibility as its custodian. Naming is a way of defining that requires deep understanding of what the essential nature of each creature is. That's why naming a child is such an important element of birth. Parents often agonize over it and sometimes get into fights with their, between themselves or with grandparents because when you name a child after someone, a family, a favorite biblical character, a favorite quality, we communicate a hope and a prayer about who and what this child will become. So I'm going to refer to Rav Aaron as an Ish in both senses. He was certainly an Adam Chashuv, Chashuv Ma'od, a teacher and leader par excellence, but he was also a very real person. He was fully human in every aspect. Someone remarked to me that she had once been invited to their home and she couldn't get over it that it was such a normal environment. That's not surprising to me because he was maybe first and foremost an ish mishpacha. I recall how moved I was by his 80th birthday party, which we were privileged to attend together with his family and a large group of his friends. The overwhelming feeling that I left with was how much like a regular birthday party this was. No stilted speeches, praising his greatness in Torah, which he certainly was, that was left for the yeshiva celebration. At this party, there were videos portraying him as a husband and a father and a grandfather, washing the dishes in a rowboat, playing with his grandchildren, reminiscences from his children about what it was like growing up with him. When his wife spoke, she evenly lovingly poked fun at him all of which made him greater to, greater to me because he was so very human. And Rav Aaron strove to excel in all aspects of what it means to be a human being. He was always conscious about having been created with Selim Elohim and behaved to others accordingly with the greatest respect, whether to students, friends, children, Jews of all stripes, and even non-Jews. He was an Ish Chesed, I recall his coming over to our house once on our visit to Israel when we were on the way out and the cab was waiting for us outside. And he insisted on carrying our luggage to the cab. It almost became a fight between him and my husband, who formerly was his chavruta in New York when they were both young. Such personal stories abound about his concern and respect for everyone. Nothing was, con was beneath him when it came to helping others. Read the personal stories on the internet. You'll get to know him better. He was an Ish Torah, intellectually and ethically. Although, as I said, I was not privileged to learn with him, I heard, I heard him lecture. I read some of his many essays about his philosophical vision of what it means to be a Torah Jew, a Yirat Shamayim, an Eved Hashem. Those were his major themes and priorities, priorities, and he broke no compromise with them. What was unique about his thought, however, was his understanding that being an Oved Hashem, a Yirei Shamayim, and a Shomer Mitzvot, did not mean that we all had to think and be the same. He believed in our individuality, our need to know and fulfill ourselves, to know and follow our own talents and interests, to build on our own personal strengths and weaknesses and to make choices based on them. On one condition, however, that we make those choices through a Torah lens that leaves room for Limut Torah and Shmirat Mitzvot. Not everyone had to choose a life or career devoted to exclusively to Torah studies, but whatever one chose, but whatever one chose had to allow for 
Torah study and Shemirat Mitzvot. Rav Aaron himself had a PhD in literature from Harvard University and often quoted poetry in his Torah lectures. In fact, I, remem I remember um, his speaking about, often speaking about his father was blind and his, just watching his Kibbut Av was amazing. And he referred often to Milton's on blindness, his poet on blindness, uh, as an expression of, of what it meant to be blind. He was, at, we made a Sheva Brachas for one of his sons and uh, his father was there at the time. And it was just, it was just a lesson in Kibbut Av, Aim, Kibbut Av, uh, watching him with his father, the tender, tenderness and the gentleness with which he approached him. He believed that all knowledge could, create, could, could contribute to a deeper understanding of Torah, because Torah was complex and required great both depth and scope. In order to value and respect Torah as the word of God, we had to delve deeply into its complexity. Like the Rambam, he believed and taught that all knowledge can help us understand better, Torah better. But the Torah must always remain the priority. There was never any doubt about that. Rav Aaron was an ish Uzan, a balanced person, shying away from extremes. In his essay on centrist orthodoxy, he tells the story of which, witnessing a scene in Yerushalayim where a delivery truck was having a difficult time maneuvering on one of the narrow streets in Yerushalayim. The driver was not wearing a kippah and a group of young yeshiva students standing nearby started to debate the Gemara about whether it was their halachic responsibility to help them if he wasn't religious. Rav Aaron commented to his father-in-law in a letter, which I want to read just the short part of it. My feeling then was, why, Rebona Shalola, must this be our choice? Can't we find children who would have helped him and still know the Gemara? Do we have to choose? I hope not. I believe not. If forced to choose, however, I would have no doubts where my loyalties lie. I prefer that they would learn Gemara, where they would learn less Gemara, but help him. He said this in the context of a critique of both education in the right and education in the modern Orthodox community. And what he basically was saying is that in the, in the right-wing community, he felt that there was not enough of an emphasis on ethical behavior. And in our community, there was not enough emphasis on deep and, and, and long committed uh, commitment to Torah study and to Torah learning. He was critiquing, well, it said, basically said that. <coughs> he was an ish emet a man of great integrity who conducted himself and taught responsibility to pursue truth at any cost. But he was also an ish shalom and did not seek to impose his views on other valid interpretations of Torah, which he generally respected. He wrote for and he taught for his community, our community. He shied away from public controversy unless he felt that it was necessary and then always firmly, but very, very respectfully. A quick and important example. 10 years ago, just the time when my husband and I made Aliyah, there was a huge controversy within the Orthodox community about the government's decision to withdraw from Aza. This, necessita this, necessitated, this would necessitate Jewish soldiers forcibly removing other Jews from their homes in Gush Katif. It was an extremely painful and divisive event. When one of the rabbis in Jerusalem ruled that it was against halacha for the soldiers to do so, and therefore they should not obey military orders, Rav Aaron, as the Rosh Hashiva of a Hester Yeshiva, where students served in the army, found it necessary to be, debate him on the subject with both halachic and rational arguments. On this he knew he must engage in controversy. Sometimes one had to learn to be an ish milchama, just as a Kaddish Baruch Hu is, as we say in the Shira. But let me read to you how he introduced his words to the rabbi. Let me preface my remarks by saying that I come not, God forbid, to provoke, nor in the role of one who feels insulted or offended. I'm not coming 
because I want to start a fight. I'm not coming because I feel personally insulted that somebody said something against the students in my yeshiva. May heaven be my witness that were it not for the importance and urgency of the matter, many see it as bordering both on Philo Hashem and on issues of life and death, I would have kept silent. My objective is merely to clarify positions and draw people closer together. And he says something similar at the end. If what a lesson we can learn from the fact that when we engage in conflicts and we engage in debates, that we listen, that we want to clarify and hear what the other person says, and we want to keep us unified rather than making these things so divisive. <coughs> I could go on with many other ways in which he was an Ish, but I want to conclude with a brief summary of Aaron's connection to my note. When the Tina community was thinking about opening a school right here, school for girls, they formulated a vision for the school that included teaching Gemara as one of the central pillars of the Judaic studies curriculum. As you know, Gemara for Girls was then, and still is now for some communities, considered against Halakha. The group wanted to clear up that issue from the outset, so they invited Rav Aaron to speak at a meeting in a private home about his halachic and personal opinion on the subject. I wasn't there at the time. I wasn't even a candidate yet for the principalship. His father-in-law, Rav Salvechik, had encouraged Gemara learning for women, Established it, a Gemara girl, established it in Maimonides, in his school in, in um, Boston, and gave the first shiur for women at Stern College in the 1970s. I, had a, I used to have a picture of it hanging in my office here. I wasn't there for the meeting, as I said, but when I was invited to become the principal of my note, I was given the tape of his words because they knew that this was an important part of my vision of the school for women and the rest is history. As you know, he subsequently gave the Hanukkah Tabayit address of my note, in which he said that Gemara for women was a requirement because it inculcates commitment to Yerat Shamayim, Torah and Mitzvot. His own daughter, Esti, is the head of Migdal Oz, considered by many the counterpart of Gush. So I repeat. Rav Aaron was my Rebbe, in the sense that he learned so much, that I learned so much from him by who he was and how he lived his life. He was our guiding light. Rav Aaron made me walk more proudly as a modern Orthodox Jew, and he taught me how to better live an authentic Torah life. Tehi zichro Baruch.